Welcome to my lecture online. The third video now is going to take the second part of the equation that we had just separated. Remember, we took the Schrodinger equation for a single particle acting in a single dimension, and we separated the portion that only depended on position and the portion that only depended on time. We then took the portion, the wave equation that only depended on time, and used it to show that the constant c, which both sides of the equation were said equal to, is actually equal to the total energy of the particle. So what we're going to do now is take this part of the equation, this is the part of the Schrodinger equation that only depends on position, and replace the constant c by what we now know is it is equal to the total energy of the particle. Next, we're going to multiply both sides of this equation by the wave function that only depends on position. When we do that, this will be negated, so remember that this will be 1, so that is now gone. We multiply this by the wave function, we multiply this by the wave function, and now we have what we call a time-independent Schrodinger equation for a particle that moves in one dimension. The dimension, of course, in this case is x. It's no longer dependent on time. This is a much easier differential equation to work with. Now notice that since the original wave function that depends both on x and time, on position and time, can be written as a product of a wave function that only depends on position and a wave function that only depends on time. And from the previous video, we found an equation for this wave function. It was equal to this. Then we can go ahead and show that if we take the wave function as of, that is dependent on both position and time and multiply it by its complex conjugate, we get this equation. This is the complex conjugate of the part that only depends on position, the complex conjugate of the part that only depends on time. All we did here is change the negative i to a positive i. And then we multiply it times the wave function that depends on position and the wave function that depends on time. Now notice when we multiply these two together, since they have opposite signs and they're the exponent of e, that when we add the exponents we get 0, e to the 0 is 1, which means that multiplying this, in other words, the wave function that depends on both position and time with its complex conjugate is exactly the same as multiplying the, the wave equation that only depends on position with the complex conjugate. Then, of course, the only thing left to do then is we then must take that, which is, of course, the probability density function, or the, yes, the probability density function, and we must then make sure that it meets the condition when we integrate it over all of space over which it can travel from negative infinity to infinity, and hopefully it only will travel in a certain small range. We know that that integral should equal 1, which means that when we draw the probability density function, so we have p only of x, only of position, and x on the axis over here, that we can see that the area underneath the curve should, of course, only equal 1. And if we then normalize it, because this is what we're going to do to normalize it, once we have it normalized, we then actually have the probability function that tells us where the particle will be as a function of position only, and time is not a factor at that point. So that's how we convert it from the Schrodinger equation that, that depends both on time and position to a Schrodinger equation that only depends on position. It'll make our life a whole lot easier. We'll show you some examples as to why.